So let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. So Paul saying, I am present tense being crucified with Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I live. However, he's alive. He's not dead. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So Paul's saying that, but it's not me that's living. It's Jesus that's living for me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. So the life that he's living inside this body, this flesh, is living by what? I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for him, that he's able to live right now according to the faith. By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus Christ loved us enough that he gave himself for us on the cross. So it is important to understand that as we start off at Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, that Paul mentions right here that he is crucified with Jesus Christ. So this is us in the flesh. Now Paul says that we are to be crucified with Jesus Christ. So the life that we live in day after day, we have to assimilate ourselves to this. Kind of like what you heard today at the preaching, right? So notice he says, I what? Am. Is that what he said? So it's present tense. I am crucified. Not in the past. So when you live a crucified life, when you kill the things of the sins of your flesh, this was not at the past at your salvation. Do you understand that fact? It's present tense right now in your life. You have to keep dying. Uh, we'll look at one example here. Keep your hand at Galatians 2 because we're going to be commenting here all the time. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, please. 1 Corinthians 15. Going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 31. And then we're going to look at Romans chapter 7. We're going to look at Romans chapter 7. So 1 Corinthians 15 and Romans 7 are the, especially Romans 7. That's the book. That's the chapter. It talks about this perfect life that you're living in, which is a crucified life. It is a duality that you're living in. You're living in a life and death situation, or life and crucified, I will call it. That way you don't get lost. So what does this mean? Life is the spiritual life within you. Crucified is your flesh, your old nature. It must die. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now notice he says which I have in Christ Jesus. Remember Galatians 2? The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. It's not me that live, but Christ liveth in me. Right? So what happens is when Jesus Christ lives inside you, there's a transformation going on where you are crucified with Jesus Christ, present tense, but you're also made alive, present tense. Crucified in what way, pastor? And made alive in what way? That sounds like a contradiction. Well, when you put these two things together, then it makes sense. Crucified the flesh. Life in what? Your spiritual nature. That's why Romans 7, it makes so much sense why Paul says, I die, I die, but I'm alive, I'm alive. I die, but I'm alive. I die, I'm alive. You know, Dr. Upman said that every Christian is uh, partially a schizo or something like that. So you got to realize this, is that Christians, we live two lives. The old man, which is our body, is dead. But then our new man, which is our spiritual nature, is alive. Let's look at Romans chapter 7 now. This is a perfect description. You know why you have to have psychology nowadays? I'll tell you why. Because the evidence of differences of natures is so evident in the Bible with flesh and spirit that mankind does not want to resort to that. They want to have a scientific explanation or a secular explanation for it. So hence comes out psychology for you. But you got to realize this, before ego, id, and super ego, and all that, the Bible already told you there's this kind of uh, 
duality, but better than that, it's actually a trio nature within you, a trio. So that's why psychology, they have this trio thing, uh, ego, super ego, and id. And they all match with what the Bible, but the Bible was way ahead of them. The ego, which is the real you, the soul, and then the id, which is the urges of your flesh, and then the super ego, which would be your spiritual side. So you have to have a scientific term for it so that you wouldn't catch that in your Bible with body, soul, and spirit. All right, but anyways, Romans chapter 7. Read verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. This sounds like a psychologically, mental, <laughs> mentally ill person that needs a psychologist. But this is the nature of body, soul, and spirit. Amen. Let's keep reading. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is, but then he explains here. Okay, what's this going on? There's something I want to do, but I, uh, but I don't do it. There's something that I don't want to do, yet I do it. What's the explanation? He explains here, <laughs> verse 17. Now then it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in me what? That is what? In my flesh. See that? There's your one life here. Dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. There's your spiritual nature there. But how to perform that which is good I find not. That spiritual side. For the good I would, spiritual, I do not, flesh. But the evil which I would not, spiritual, that I do, flesh. You get that now? Duality of nature. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but here it is again, sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God, spiritual, and then he explains here, after the what? Inward man. So that's why Paul is saying that I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15. I am crucified. Uh, Galatians chapter 2. Why does he put that present tense? Because this guy who wants to do evil has to be present tense killed. It has to be dead. Whereas this other man here has to be constantly made alive. You know why we have dead churches today? We got a dead Christianity in America today? Very simple. Because what happened is, is that we don't make ourselves alive. We're all dead. We're all a machine. We're all prone and programmed with the, uh, the hustle and bustle uh, due to the advancement of technology, education, work, and conveniences that please our flesh. So because of that, that's why we, you're, you're not resurrecting within you. This has a lot to do with the preaching today, you may have noticed. It has a lot of application to the preaching today. Okay, so let's look at Galatians chapter 2 again. Galatians chapter 2. So verse 20 is a great verse to memorize concerning your spiritual struggles is Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Now as we come to the next verse right here, we know that Jesus Christ, because it is his shed blood that promised us salvation, this is where we receive grace from. Amen? Amen. Okay, so then because of that, why are you working your way for salvation if Jesus paid it all for you? Now look at this verse. This is a great verse to memorize against people who believe in good works for salvation. I do not frustrate the grace of God. So Paul's saying, I don't want to frustrate God's grace. Why? I don't want God to be frustrated concerning the grace. Why? For if righteousness come by the law... If you insist that your righteousness, the way you got saved, is by the law, how you live, then Christ is what? Dead in vain. So a good old Roman Catholic who has a crucifix that she's wearing around her neck with Jesus dying on the cross, you tell the Catholic this if the Catholic believes in good works for salvation. Tell the Catholic, you're just wasting your time wearing that thing around your neck. You don't believe in that. The Catholic might go, no, I treasure it. I kiss the crucifix all the time. And you tell the Catholic, no, if you really treasure and believe in that, then why do you think your good works count for salvation? Exactly. So you can use that line on them. 
Not only that, if anyone teaches that, well, you know, um, I do believe that because Jesus died, he granted us forgiveness, but I believe that we still have to do something ourselves to earn our way to heaven. And this even includes, sadly, saved Christians today who adhere to a false doctrine called Lordship Salvation. Lordship Salvation teaches because you are genuinely saved by faith, there has to be good works uh, and a significant change that we see in your life because works are supposed to follow faith. That's what they teach. But here's the thing. If we are supposed to realize that, okay, so if I don't have any good works in my life, then that means I'm not really saved by faith then? That's what they're going to insist. Yeah. Well, then you tell them this. Then if my works after it count for salvation, why did, why did Jesus even have to die then? See, Jesus died to give you full salvation so you have no part in it whatsoever. That's the important point. Either Jesus gave us full salvation by the cross or he didn't. That's the point of that verse. That's why it's a very powerful verse against salvation by works. So here are people who try to earn their way to heaven. These people are working very hard. They're like going to church. They're like getting baptized. Well, you know, baptism washes away my sins. Well, you know, I should go to church. Well, I pray daily. I'm a very religious person. I live by the golden rule. No, all of these don't count. All of these don't count. Otherwise, if you think that you had anything to do with it, then Jesus didn't have to do anything himself. Jesus did it all for you, so this grace invalidates these. Now, this is very interesting against your Calvinist friends. So let's say this Calvinist right here, well, you know, I believe in irresistible grace. Now, some of you might go, what in the world is that, Pastor? It's a made-up terminology that Calvinist scholars like to use because they always make up terms themselves because they have nothing better to do with their lives. So then they'll make up terms that you don't, that is not a scriptural term anyways. But aside from that fact, let's just uh, go with our little friends here. So they s believe in a doctrine called irresistible grace. Concerning irresistible grace, what they believe is that this grace is irresistible. So see, you cannot resist it. That's one of their doctrines, the five points of Calvinism. Five points of Calvinism, famously called tulip. So that's why within a, when, whenever you look at icons on, and memes online, you always see a tulip and then a Calvinist underneath that. That's a famous thing. So anyways, I see this camera working up. Is it, is it, is it going online properly? Uh, we were until you just pointed it out. <laughs> okay. Well, keep an eye out on the cameras, please, all right? Both cameras, okay? Both cameras, please keep an eye out. So, anyways, all right, as long as that camera's running, then we should be fine, okay? Because they'll be uploaded online. All right. All right, so Calvinists believe in this doctrine, which means that once God elects a person to get saved, so remember, you don't have free choice. Calvinism does not believe in free will for salvation. If God chooses you to get saved, you have no free choice whatsoever. You have to get saved no matter what. That's what Calvinists teach. Well, then that means then, Pastor, if there's a person burning in hell, then God made it that way. You're right. The Calvinists don't want to say it that way, but let's be honest, that's what it means. Now, here's the thing. So then this is their doctrine, irresistible grace, because once God gives you his grace, you cannot resist it. So then let's say right here that God says that, okay, so, uh, Gene, you're going to get God's grace, whereas Young cannot get God's grace. So I elect Gene to go to heaven, whereas Young will have to fry in hell for all eternity. <laughs> so then, Gene cannot resist God's grace. I cannot resist it. I have no free choice, and I have to accept it. And no matter what free choice my brother says, then he's going to fry in hell. It's too bad, okay? Boo-hoo for him. So the thing is, is that that's what Calvinists teach concerning, let's say, Gene and Young, for example. But, for example, okay, hypothetically speaking, okay? But anyways, <laughs> so 
What I just received is called irresistible grace. You see that? Because I cannot resist it. Well, look at Galatians. Look at that verse again. I do not what? Frustrate the grace of God. Why? I thought you cannot resist God's grace. But why is it that you can aggravate it, resist it, frustrate it? That does not make sense. So notice that Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, it invalidates this. Because this grace right here, it shows that you can frustrate it. It can be frustrated. 